All right, well, thank you for those songs. Certainly thankful to be back here this evening. And we're going to Mark chapter 9. We are in a brief series um, on discipleship. So we want to continue that this evening. Mark chapter 9, we'll be looking at verses 1 to 8. The message this evening is entitled, Listen to Him. So Mark chapter 9, beginning with verse 1. And He said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that there be some of them that stand here which shall not taste of death, till they have seen the kingdom of God come with power. And after six days Jesus taketh with Him Peter and James and John and leadeth them up into an high mountain apart by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. And his raiment became shining, exceeding white as snow, so as no fuller on earth can white them. And there appeared unto them Elias, or Elijah, with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. And Peter answered and said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here, and let us make three tabernacles, one for thee, and one for Moses, and one for Elijah." And he wist not what to say, for they were sore afraid. And there was a cloud that overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud, saying, This is my beloved Son, hear him. And suddenly, when they had looked round about, they saw no man anymore, save Jesus only with themselves. So after Jesus told the disciples that he must be rejected and killed by the elders, chief priests, and scribes of Israel, Peter rebuked him for saying that, and Jesus then rebuked Peter in turn. So in the last paragraph of chapter 8, Jesus makes plain that this path of suffering before glory is not only His, but the path of all those who follow Him. Now this doesn't mean that all of His followers will die a martyr's death, or that we should run and jump off a cliff sort of thing but that they must deny themselves and take up their crosses and follow Him. And of course, it has meant a martyr's death for many throughout history and will mean that for many now and into the future um, until He returns. So Jesus moved beyond just this present life, though, by speaking of losing your own soul and being ashamed at His coming. And these references speak of judgment. They speak of the reality of life after death. And Jesus' words provoke us to think about the value and the purpose and the meaning of life. Such reflection on the life to come informs us how we should live now. What does it mean to be a disciple of Jesus Christ to follow Him? And though it isn't explicit at this point, we know the disciples were thinking about the kingdom that they thought was soon to come. And they were thinking about their place in it. They were somewhat preoccupied with the visions of glory that they had when Jesus reigned from Jerusalem. And Jesus' words were a reminder to them about the reality of life and the fact that humility comes before honor. Now chapter 9 opens with the account of the transfiguration, which occurred six days after the previous teaching. This event was only witnessed by three of the disciples, and then they were not to speak of it until after the resurrection. So after Jesus finished His ministry in Galilee, and He has turned toward Jerusalem, He speaks openly to His disciples about the necessity of His death and His resurrection afterward. But the disciples don't comprehend this. And they are wrestling with what it meant and what it meant for the kingdom. From this time, Jesus also speaks more openly about the kingdom and how the crucifixion and resurrection fit into God's kingdom plan. Though for the disciples at this point, 
that would seem to be more like a derailment of God's kingdom plan than anything. Well, the transfiguration here serves as a key event to confirm Peter's confession of Jesus, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, as Matthew reported it, to confirm the necessity of the Messiah's death, and to confirm the assurance of the future kingdom. Now, the disciples will not understand this event um, until after the resurrection. And when we read it in light of Jesus' preceding words, we realize this event confirms the path of suffering for the Messiah and for His followers. And it's not. it confirms that suffering is not meaningless and it does not derail the glory that is surely to come. So we want to look at this in two parts. Verse 1 gives us a predictive link between um, the two passages. And then verses 2 to 8, which give us the account of the transfiguration itself. So we'll begin looking here with verse 1. And he said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that there be some of them that stand here which shall not taste of death, so they have seen the kingdom of God come with power. Now Mark begins this verse with and, um, Kai in the Greek, and he gives no other specifics other than Jesus said, and Jesus said unto them. So this is obviously connected to the previous statement the, at the end of chapter number 8, where Jesus spoke about His coming in the glory of His Father with His holy angels. But it's also a verse that is transitional to the next event, which begins in the next verse, in verse number 2, and that is the transfiguration. So it is, it is a verse that connects both of these things together and transitions between them, showing um, the meaning of this event, the significance of it. Now this is, verse 1 here, is the first mention of the kingdom since the kingdom parables in Mark chapter number 4. And the Gospel of Mark mentions the Messianic kingdom 16 times in this book. There are five mentions of the kingdom prior to chapter number 9. And in fact, all of those mentions are in chapters 1 and 4. You have two mentions um, in chapter 1, you have three mentions in chapter 4. And then there's not another mention of the kingdom until you get to chapter 9 and verse 1. However, from chapter 9 to the end of the book, there are 11 mentions of the kingdom. And out of those 11, seven of those are in chapters 9 and 10. So we get a concentration in these two chapters, the most dense concentration of references to the kingdom in the events and the teachings that happen in chapters 9 and and 10. Of course, there's four mentions in the rest of the book, one in chapter 11, one in chapter 12, one in chapter 14, one in chapter 15. And so as Jesus' death draws near, and He's speaking more openly about His death, the kingdom is an important subject, particularly as it relates to Jesus' death and resurrection. Now, Mark 9.1 is one of those verses that has a host of interpretations for what this verse means. And so you, if you look at uh, various commentaries, you're, you'll, you might see lengthy um, sections detailing several common interpretations and, and so on. Some of the interpretations for this verse are actually a result of er erroneously conflating this verse with some other similar but different statements. Now maybe the most common view is that Jesus was talking about the resurrection and His disciples seeing Him after the resurrection. When He says there's some standing here that will not taste of death till they've seen the kingdom of God come in power. Now one obvious problem with that view, even again it is a very popular view, I don't know if it's the most popular, but it is very common as I was um, researching it, one obvious problem with that is that Jesus said they would see the kingdom come with power and not that they would see the Son of Man 
risen from the dead with power. So he did make a different statement. Well, trying to account for this leads to a dividing of the Messianic kingdom into some sort of a spiritual entity and some sort of a physical entity. So you have a spiritual entity that comes first that they believe is referenced here, and you have a physical entity that would come later. Of course, the problem with that is that the Bible never talks about the kingdom that way. Another problem is that Jesus said some of the disciples would see it before they died, but not all of them. Now, I suppose Judas didn't see Jesus after he was resurrected because he did die beforehand. But Judas wasn't a believer, and that would be a really odd way of putting this if that is what was intended. I mean, later when Jesus singled out Judas, he said, one of you will betray me, not some of you will not betray me. So Jesus' prophecy here, what was he, what was he talking about? That they would not taste of death until they've seen, some of them. Well, Jesus' prophecy is actually about the transfiguration event that follows immediately after this statement. And that is exactly what Peter confirms about this in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 16 to 18, when Peter says, For we have not followed cunningly devised fables, when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of His majesty. For He received from God the Father honor and glory, when there came such a voice to Him from the excellent glory, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven we heard, and we were with Him in the Holy Mount. So Peter confirms, he speaks of this coming of Jesus Christ and receiving of glory and honor of the Father in a reference to this transfiguration, saying that they were eyewitnesses to this. Peter further, later in, in 2 Peter, still talks about a future coming of the Lord that is associated with the day of the Lord, so he is distinguishing between those two events. Jesus also said that there would be some that wouldn't taste of death before they saw this. And that's actually confirmed in the next verse because Jesus takes only Peter, James, and John. He doesn't take any of the rest of the disciples. Now some people object to that, saying, why would He prophesy that they wouldn't die within six days? That seems you know, sort of an odd thing to say. Well... I don't really think that poses a problem because that objection is more focusing on the three rather than the rest. In other words, if, if we look at Jesus' words, He says, some of you will not taste of death till you see the kingdom come with power. And He's referring to this transfiguration glory that they were given a preview of, three of them. Peter, James, and John then saw what the rest of them did not see before they died. And in fact, they still haven't seen even to this day. And they will not see until the resurrection at the coming of Jesus Christ. So the effect for them would obviously be the same as it was for Peter, James, and John, but they would be told about it after the resurrection. And they would understand after the resurrection, what the meaning and significance of this event was. So let's get down into the account of the transfiguration, beginning with verse 2. And after six days, Jesus taketh with him Peter and James and John, and leadeth them up into a high mountain apart by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. So Mark connects this event with a specific time lapse of six days, Um, to the prediction in the previous verse. Six days afterward is when this occurred. Jesus, we're told, took Peter and James and John. He took them as witnesses to this event that would be spoken of by them after the resurrection, which obviously they did, as this is in Mark's Gospel. Mark was not a witness to this event. The high mountain that He took them into is not identified. And there are several possibilities um, that have been suggested by different scholars. 
since they were in the region of Caesarea Philippi, they were north of Galilee. Mount Hermon seems like probably the most likely location, um, but I wouldn't say that we can be 100% sure of which mountain that they were in. Now, the word for transfigured that is used here is a word that means to be transformed or to be changed from one form into another. And Mark notes that this happened before them. In other words, they saw it happen. Jesus didn't disappear and then reappear in some glorified form or what have you. They saw it happen. They're looking at Jesus and He has changed before their eyes into this other form. And this um, change He describes in the next verse, in verse number 3. And His raiment became shining, exceeding white as snow, so as no fuller on earth can white them. So Mark describes Jesus being transformed into a dazzling, radiant brightness. And in fact, he uses a repetition of terms to, to describe it, to, um, to add emphasis to it. He speaks about a fuller here, and a, and a fuller was a cloth dresser. Um, and Mark probably refers to the bleaching out of cloth by a fuller, something that they would have certainly been engaged in. And what he says here is that the whiteness of Jesus' clothing was beyond anything possible by earthbound technology. That's what he's saying. He said it was, became, it was shining, exceeding white as snow, as no fuller on earth can white them. So there's no human technology that could bring the, a cloth to the whiteness of what Jesus' garments were. Now, Mark has just made two references to Jesus' coming. He spoke of His coming in, in the glory of His Father with the holy angels in chapter 8 and verse 38. And in chapter 9 and verse 1, He just spoke about the kingdom of God coming with power. This coming in the transfiguration then is a preview of of His glorious coming to set up His kingdom on earth and to begin His reign as the second Adam, son of David, over the Davidic kingdom. In other words, His coming in the glory of His Father and the kingdom coming with power are referring to one and the same events. And further, in, in Mark chapter 13, verses 24 and 26, when He talks about that coming, he writes, but in those days, after the tribulation, the sun shall be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars of heaven shall fall, and the powers that are in heaven shall be shaken, and then shall they see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. Jesus Himself also referred to coming in glory at different times in uh, different places during His ministry and the other Gospel accounts. So this is why the rest of the disciples will not see it before they have died. So Jesus certainly had a resurrection glory that we could speak of after that He was resurrected. But the Bible does speak of a distinct glory and power that He will come with when He comes to set up His kingdom on the earth. So again, this is what is being described in this dazzling radiance of appearance that Peter and James and John saw, but the rest of the disciples will not see um, until the time of the resurrection and His return. Verse number 4, And there appeared unto them Elijah with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. So next, the three of the disciples saw Elijah and Moses with Jesus. Now, I'll say at the outset, when it comes to this appearance of Elijah and Moses, that we can probably ask a whole lot more questions than we can actually answer about what's going on and why in this instance. There are some good reasons that we can put forth why it should be Moses and Elijah, there are probably 
just about as many reasons that can be put forward as to why some other combination of Old Testament figures would make sense as well. Moses was the figure at the exodus of Israel to bring them into the promised land. He was the the prophet sent by God to fulfill that role. Elijah is the figure prophesied to signal Israel's restoration in the end time. So in, in a sense, Moses was that leading figure to bring them into the promised land the first time. And Elijah is a figure associated through prophecy of of Israel being gathered and restored to their land in the end time. Both Moses and Elijah are mentioned in that regard in Malachi chapter 4, verses 4 to 6 in Malachi's prophecy. As far as I can tell, that's as good a reason as I can see biblically why that Moses and Elijah appeared to Jesus. And again, we could probably ask a lot more questions about their form and 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 what they um, you know what they would have looked like and and appeared as and so on. But we're not told, and so it's obviously not extremely significant to the account. Mark makes note that Elijah and Moses were talking with Jesus when they appeared. Luke adds in his account that they were talking with Jesus about his death in Jerusalem. That's in Luke chapter 9 and verse 31. Mark doesn't doesn't add that bit though. At the very least, we know that this whole event confirmed Jesus as the Messiah, confirmed Jesus as the Son of God, confirmed the necessity of His death, and confirmed His coming kingdom. All of those things are confirmed in this transfiguration event that Peter and James and John witnessed. Let me come to verse 5. And Peter answered and said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. And let us make three tabernacles, one for thee and one for Moses and one for Elijah. So Peter responds in his characteristic way of outspokenness. And he addresses Jesus as Master or Rabbi. Uh, Some want to make a lot out of that, but that was the common way that they addressed Jesus as master or rabbi. And it also corresponds to their most prevalent identity as being His disciples. Being His disciples being yoked to a rabbi was a a very um, common imagery. So they were His learners. Peter offers here, in his response, to build three tabernacles or booths. These describe tents, one for Jesus, one for Moses, one for Elijah. Now, first of all, Peter is not here suggesting some sort of a memorial shrine to worship um, Jesus, Moses, and Elijah. Most likely, Peter saw this unprecedented event of the kingdom glory of Jesus, and especially the appearance of Elijah before the coming day of the Lord, as meaning that the kingdom was now unfolding. The kingdom is now beginning. And He is here at this historic event. Zechariah also prophesied in Zechariah chapter 14 that when Messiah reigns as king on the earth, Zechariah 14, 9, that the nations of the earth, those that are left, in other words, those that have believed, have been converted to Him, those that have not been destroyed uh, in His coming, The nations of the earth will come to Jerusalem for the Feast of Tabernacles. That's Zechariah chapter 14 and verse number 16. So Peter most likely had something like this in mind. Thought that these events meant that the kingdom was unfolding here and now right before their eyes. Peter was wrong about the timing, but his intention seems to be confirmed by the discussion that comes after they come off the mountain when they start talking about the coming of Elijah before the day of the Lord. So again, we're not given a lot of information as to why Peter wanted to do what he wanted to do, but this seems the most likely. Now in verse 6, 
Mark adds, for he wist not what to say, for they were sore afraid. So he adds that Peter did not know what to say in this situation. And I can't imagine myself doing any better. I'd probably be um, face down on the ground like Daniel or, or John or, or something and, and you know, not knowing what to say. It seemed like Peter felt that some response was called for. And maybe, we're just not given a lot of information really in any of the gospel accounts. Maybe he simply means Peter didn't know what else to say. There's just nothing else that Peter could think of. But either way, Peter, um, he's not rebuked. Um, he's, not, he's not corrected. And the account moves on. Verse 7, And there was a cloud that overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved Son. Hear Him. So a cloud overshadows Jesus, Moses, and Elijah. And a voice addresses Peter and James and John out of this cloud. Obviously, this is echoes of the scene at Jesus' baptism in Mark chapter 1 and verse number 11. And it is the voice of God the Father that speaks um, to the three disciples, confirming the identity and the words of Jesus. This is my beloved Son. Hear Him. Listen to Him. So God refers, I believe that we have an allusion here, to the prophecy of Psalm chapter 2 and verse number 7 about His anointed Son King, and He identifies Jesus of Nazareth as the One. He is this Son. The term beloved echoes the description of uh, that is repeated of Abraham's son Isaac in Genesis chapter number 22. And so then Jesus corresponds. He is the beloved Son of God, and He corresponds to the God-provided Lamb in the person of His own Son that took the place of Isaac as a sacrifice. God then instructs the three disciples to listen to Jesus. This is my well-beloved Son. Listen to Him. Hear Him echoing the prophecy of Moses in Deuteronomy chapter 18 and verse number 15, that God would raise up a prophet like Moses and that the people must listen to him. So this context shows the thrust of this command when Jesus says, or when God says of Jesus to hear him, the thrust of this command is to listen to what Jesus has to say about his death. We've already seen this initial open statement about his death to come, and we saw Peter's reaction. Peter says, no, no, let this not be. He, re he rebuked Jesus for the same. God the Father is speaking of His well-beloved Son Jesus, and He is saying, hear Him. Hear what He has to say about His death. Peter had already been resistant. The other disciples no doubt he's, he's representative of them. They'd already been resistant to Jesus talking about His death. They had high and glorious grand thoughts about the kingdom of God. And here they are seeing this display of His kingdom glory. And, and again, I'm surprised that Peter is even able to speak. And yet, no doubt, they think the kingdom is beginning to unfold. And God says, hear Him. Listen to Him. Listen to what He has to say about His death, about His suffering about His resurrection, and about His kingdom that is yet to come. Then we come to verse number 8. And suddenly, when they had looked round about, they saw no man anymore, save Jesus only with themselves. So Mark uses this term, this, uh, term suddenly, indicating that it wasn't some sort of a slow fade, but... It was a disappearance as sudden as the appearance had been. Moses and Elijah were gone. Jesus was back to His incarnational form. They had witnessed a miraculous sign event that was obviously intended for their benefit and the benefit of other believers who received their witness. Just like you and I here today as we read the, the witness that they have left behind. So the disciples continued to struggle with their expectation of messianic triumph and the establishment of the kingdom with 
Jesus' increasingly plain message of suffering and death. So this transfiguration event served to join the suffering and the kingdom glory together so that they would understand better after Jesus' resurrection. So, why is this here? Why did this event happen? Why is it here? What does it have to do with discipleship that is such a focus in this section of Mark's Gospel? Well, Jesus had predicted His own suffering and death. But not only did He predict that, He went on later to command that all His followers must deny themselves and take up their crosses and follow Him, ready to death if that be where that path leads. The transfiguration shows that the suffering and even the death of Jesus is not the end of the plan, but it's a part of the plan on the way to that end goal. The end goal is Jesus in the glory of His Father receiving His kingdom and reigning on this earth alongside His saints in their inheritance. That's the end goal. So the experience of suffering, even to martyrdom for His followers, is not a sign of losing God's love and God's favor. Jesus who is marching toward His death knowingly and willingly has already said He's going there to be killed. And He will continue to say it until it actually happens. And yet, here is God the Father confirming, this is My Son, and not only My Son, My well-beloved Son. This is He. So suffering and death, they are not the final word. They're not pointless. God confirmed His love for His Son. And the disciples have the assurance of their faith in Christ and the assurance that following Him, that His kingdom will come. They will receive the inheritance. They will have victory over all enemies, even over Death. So again, this event teaches disciples to deny themselves, take up their crosses, and follow after Jesus Christ. His path to glory led through humiliation and suffering. We are following in that path. We don't know what all lies ahead of us. We don't know to what extent. We don't know what all that that's going to mean, but we do have this assurance that that's not the end. That's not the final word. That doesn't mean that we've lost God's love or favor. In fact, it is quite the opposite. All right, that's all of our message for tonight. We will close with a hymn.